All right, Shabbat Shalom. We are in the middle of Kislev, the month of Hanukkah. At the end of this month is Hanukkah, which, which used to be my favorite festival for a long time because of all the biblical doctrines in it, even though it's not a biblical festival. It is a biblical festival because there's so much in the scriptures about it. I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite most heartfelt and close to me things in the scriptures. The logo for our congregation, Lev Zion, is all about this that I'm going to talk about today, this teaching, this understanding that God dwells in human beings. But, but doing that effectively, living it out effectively, understanding it effectively is a real trick. It's very difficult. And the reason is that there's so much religion in the earth that everybody, Everybody, I don't care who they are, I don't care who you are, you have religion in you. So do I. And religion is the one thing, the one thing, the one major thing that keeps everybody away from God. It doesn't bring people close to God, it keeps people away from God. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. But this logo of Lev Tzion, it has, a, it has an illustration of, of the scriptures, the Torah, which become a human being. Up in the top, you can see where it becomes a human being. And up here, there's a person. And the Torah is becoming that person. That's the word became flesh. But as it becomes a Torah scroll down here, it's enwrapped with the Spirit of God, with a flame. And that Spirit of God turns into the dedech, the road, the way. Because the Torah is the way that leads up to this here, which is the city of God. And you'll notice that the city of God is inside this person's heart. In the Bible, the heart is like the guts. It's not, you know, this thing that beats blood here. It's, it's the guts. It's the inside. And that's where the heart is, and that's where Zion is in this, in this logo. And this concept of Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, earthly Jerusalem, which is, which is Judaism. It is Judaism. That's what Judaism is. It is Zion. It is the heavenly Jerusalem. The whole package of where God lives and how to live for God and the whole thing is what we call Judaism. The way of the Jew. So that is what I'm going to talk about, that city inside the heart. We come to a Torah portion today. This is one of my favorite, favorite concepts in the Bible, um, obviously, because it's in our logo. Um, and Lev Sion means heart of Zion, or Zion heart. And that's the heart of every Jew is, is Jerusalem. That's what... Jews have said for millennia that the heart of every Jew is Jerusalem. Why do we say that? Because that's where God lives. And Judaism teaches us how to feel God inside. How to feel him and how to live him with him inside. So I wrote a song yesterday called Hamakom and this is about what I'm going to teach today. Your name, I'm a cold in 
the heart of all your people. Oh, I will bring to you all I offer there. Awesome here in Hamakon, God is in this place. Rock of Jacob is God's house where we seek your face. Set your name on Israel, set up your pillar there. Gate of heaven where you judge, where nothing can compare. Hamakom, it's the place that you have chosen. Hamakom, where you set your name. I'm a comb in the heart of all your people, and oh, I will bring to you all I offer there. Dear Eloheinu, our show, city of God and holy mountain, the Asu. Shahanti, the Tocham, build for me a resting place, and I will dwell in you. Build for me a resting place, and I will dwell in you. I'm a comb, it's the place that you have chosen. I'm a comb. It's where you said your name I'm a comb in the heart of all your people Oh, and I will bring to you all I offer there Oh, and I will bring to you all I offer concept of when the sanctuary was built that God didn't say build for me a sanctuary so I can live in it this concept of him saying build for me a sanctuary so I can live in you that was established back in Exodus when God said to build the tabernacle and this concept is very very close to my heart it's um, it leads to all things Jewish basically that God said, build for me that model of heaven, a little model of heaven, so that you can know me. And that is inside, in the heart. So, we're going to go to the Torah portion, Vayetze, and he departed, Genesis 28, 10, and we're going to read just that passage, the first passage about when Jacob goes to this place called Hamakom. I just said the place called Hamakom. The place, the place, is Hamakom in Hebrew. And the place that he was at, Jerusalem, is called Hamakom six times in this passage. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he reached Hamakom, Ba-Makom. Ba means in. So he reached in Makom, in the place. And spent the night there, for the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of Hamakom, and made it a pillow for his head, and lay down in Bamakom, in the place. That's three. And he had a dream, and behold, a ladder. Now, it's not necessarily a ladder. It's a sulam, which means an upward. That's all it means, an upward. And I believe it was a twisting upward. And the reason is that's what the, the upward was in the temple. In the temple, there was uh, two spiral staircases, one from the first floor to the second floor, and then another one from the second floor to the third floor in the temple. So I believe it was a spiral staircase, like 
like um, a DNA strand. So he lay down in the Makom, in that place, Bamakom, Hazot, and he had a dream, and behold, a sulam, an upward, was set up on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Then, behold, the Lord was standing above it and said, I am Yehovah, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Yitzchak. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your seed. So he's continuing this, this promise to Abraham and then to Isaac, his father, that God would do several things. He would bless him, he'd give him the land, he'd give him seed continually, lots of seed, and that in that seed all the, the, the nations of the earth would be blessed, which is a promise of the Messiah. So there's a lot packed into that, into that uh, promise. So he says, um, I'm giving you and your seed this land. I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this ground. <clears throat> then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Yehovah is, is in this place, Habamakom, in this place. How awesome is Hamakom? That is the fifth time he said Hamakom. This is none other than the house of God. None other than, than Beit El, the house of God. And this is Sha'ar HaShemayim, the gate. Now, a gate is not a swinging door, wrought iron door. A gate is a big room in which judgments are made. This is the gate of heaven. So Jacob arose early, took the stone that he had placed as a support for his head, and set it up as a memorial stone. Now this word for memorial stone is what we're going to be studying today. It's what we're going to look at today. A memorial stone, a pillar, and poured oil on its top. Then he named that place Hamakom. He named that place Hamakom Hazot, that place Beit El and said, this stone, which I've set up as a memorial stone, a pillar, will be God's house. What gave him the right to say that? Who's, who, you know, the temple wasn't, the site of the temple was not discovered until almost 2,000 years after this. Um, let's see, one, two, three, no, I'm sorry, 1,000 years after this with David. And it wasn't even discovered by David until uh, his last years on, on, on earth. He was an old, old man. And God showed him the site of Jerusalem was God's house. And so David wanted to build, God's, build God a house, his whole reign as, as a king over Israel. But God did, said, you're not going to do it. Your son is going to do it, Solomon. And then Solomon built the temple there on this very site that, that Jacob is laying on and having this dream. So my question is, what gave Jacob the right to say that that's going to be God's house? Well, he saw it by the Spirit. He saw it as a prophet. He saw it in prophecy. So he said, he named that place, Hamakom, Beit El, and said, this stone, which I've set up as a memorial stone or pillar, will be God's house. And of everything you give me, I'll give a tenth to you. And where do we bring the tenth, the tithe, to that place, to God's house? So, we're going to look at this stone, this memorial stone, and what it is in Hebrew, and, and is it good or is it bad? I mean, he does this. He sets up this rock and anoints it with oil, but there's scriptures that say God hates that thing, whatever that is in Hebrew. That's what we're going to look at. Now the word in Hebrew for that stone, memorial stone or pillar, is matseva. It sounds like matzabal, matseva, matseva. And it means something stationed. It can be translated a pillar, a column, a garrison, or fort. So it's much bigger than just a rock. It can be an actual building, a garrison or fort, a mastaba. Now look at this, a mastaba, that's, that's an Egyptian word. Mastaba. And it sounds exactly like Matsaba, only the S and the T sound are switched. Matsaba, Matsaba. It's the same word. Well, where did they get Mastaba? From Matsaba. That's where they got it from. So it can also be a memorial or a, we say trophy, but it's, don't think American trophy. A trophy is like a, a signpost, a big giant thing that says this is where this happened. A memorial. A memorial. 
a pillar supporting a house. Now, I don't agree with this. I got this from Strong's and Jacinius. I do not agree that it could be a pillar supporting a house, and you're going to see why I say that. It's from the, war, from the root, natsav, natsav. Something set upright, standing, a pillar, a statue, or an idol. Now, this teaching today is pulling together two of the biggest, the, the biggest things in my life. And, and this, this really, I love this teaching, and I try to revisit it as often as I can. And it's because it, it has two things. Number one, Hamakom, which is Jerusalem, the place. And number two, pictures. That the way to know God is Judaism. And... The difference between religion and idolatry, and it's all about the word tzav, like mitzvah, you know, do a mitzvah, you know, the, the mitzvot, which they translate commandment, but is really a set up or established thing. It's the same word as this. So it could be good or it could be bad. And that's why I love to talk about this, because everybody wants to follow a commandment, but there aren't any. Sorry, but there aren't any in the Bible. There's 613 set up or established things. All right, so that's why I love this so much, and that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to weave these two things together as well as I can, and hopefully you'll, you'll get what I'm saying. So in Exodus 23, in Leviticus 26, and in Deuteronomy 7, and other verses, it says, you shall not set this up. But this is what Jacob set up. A, mas, a, a metziva, a metziva, or a mastaba. And God says, I, I hate that. I hate it, I hate it, I don't want to see that. Exodus 23, 24, you shall not worship their gods. He's talking to Israel when they go into the land of Israel. And he says, you shall not serve their gods, nor do according to their deeds. Don't do what they do. But you shall utterly overthrow them and break their matzevot, whatever this is, memorial stones or pillar or whatever it is, in pieces. And remember, it's not just a rock, which I'm going to show you. It's much bigger than that. It could be a rock, but it's much bigger than that. And God says, break that whole thing. Just knock them down and break them and destroy them. Then Leviticus 26, he says, you shall not make for yourselves idols. You shall not set up for yourselves a carved image, that's wood, or a matzevot, or matzevot, memorial stones or pillars, nor shall you place a figured stone, a carved stone. So you don't make carvings in wood, don't make carvings in stone as idols. Uh, to bow in your land, to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. Because this is what the nations did. They, there were three things. There were idols of wood, and they would actually plant whole groves of trees and worship the trees. They're called Asherah. It's an Asherah. They're feminine. They're females. And they would carve these into female figures. So they, they would make Asherah out of wood, or they would carve stone idols, or they would set up this whatever it is, Matzavah, which could be a stone. It could be a carved stone, or it could be a wood, or it could be... Um, Almost a whole building. That's the same exact thing. So you can see it developing into an idol's house. It's not just a little stone. It could be a whole house. Deuteronomy 7. Thus you shall deal with them. Talking to Israel when they go into the land. You shall destroy their altars, break down their matzevot, cut down their groves. See, there's the groves and burn their graven images with fire. So it's wood and stone. But a matzevah is stone. Here's some more. Deuteronomy 12.3, You shall overthrow their altars, break their matzevot. Now it links the altar with the matzevah, which is really important, because I want you to picture um, maybe six feet high, a big stone structure with a platform on it, about six feet tall, with an altar on top of that. That's a matzavah. And you're going to see that. You shall overthrow their altars and break their matzavot. 
and burn their groves with fire, and you shall chop down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of, look what it says, out of Hamakom. Hamakom Hahu means uh, that place. Hamakom Hahu. That puts the Matzavot where? In Jerusalem. It puts it not just in the land of Israel, but in Jerusalem. And that is what happened. That's exactly what happened. They set up matzavot and idols of wood and stone right in the temple. In the temple courts, the, the court of Israel, in the court of the women outside that court, and in the house itself. And so God says, I, I, I want that gone. I hate it. I want you to knock them down, destroy them. Deuteronomy 16, Neither shall you set up any matzavot, which the Lord your God hates. But Jacob set one up and said, This is God's house. And yet God hates it. Now, if you're a, I'm going to say this word even though I hate it, if you're a legalist, which by the way never appears in the Bible not one single time, but if you love the letter of the law, and you want to obey those commandments, you got a huge problem here. Because it says that God hates for the Jewish people to set up a matzavah, and that's exactly what Jacob did. He set up a matzavah, he took the stone he had placed as a support for his head, set it up as a matzavah, poured oil on it, that means anointed it, and named that place Bethel. And then he says, Jacob said, this matzavah, this stone, that, have I, that I have set up as a matzavah will be God's house. And then God turns around and says, I hate that. Really? I guess it depends on how it's done, huh? You have to know what God's de desire is in order to understand God's words. You cannot come at it with your own feeling and thoughts and beliefs and culture. You can't. You have to know what his heart is to know what he's saying. And this is a good example. Case in point. If he says he hates a matzavah, you better know what kind of matzavah is it. it is. If he loves a certain matzavah, you better know what kind of matzavah that is. That's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to try to make those as clear as I possibly can. I'm going to separate them as best I can to make them clear. First Kings 14.23. Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and provoked him to, to kinah, to jealousy, with their sins. For they also built them ramot, high places, and matzavot, and groves on every high hill and under every green tree, even in Jerusalem. And if you, as you read the story in 1 Kings, as it goes on, you can see it's right in Jerusalem right in the holy place, right in the courts. I don't think there were any in the Holy of Holies, but they did actually set up an idol and a matzavah in the temple itself. Here are some matzavot from around the world. The first one is called the Ashok Pillar in India, and it is Buddhist. It's got a big lion on the top of it. What in the world is that? Why? Why have a giant pillar with a carved lion on top of it? What does that do? That was for worship. They would look at it and they would worship it. They would worship the god that that represents. And these are Buddhists. Buddhists have thousands of gods. Sorry, tens of thousands. This is one of them. Here's cairn, cairn stones from Ireland. Now these cairn stones are carved so beautiful. And this is, uh, this is exactly one of the things that God said not to do. To carve the stones. These um, wavy lines, that's the water god. And the air god. And the fire god. And so they would, they would set up these cairn stones. These are matzavot. And they'd worship them, or the God that they represented. These monolithic stones are in Israel. These are in Gezer, Tel Gezer, which is in Israel. And they're about, it looks to be about 
14, 15 feet tall. And uh, there's a bunch of them, and they're all in a row, just like uh, Stonehenge. I don't have any stone pictures of Stonehenge here because everybody knows it. But these are some that maybe you don't know. Probably most people know about the ancestor stones or sculptures in Easter Island. By the way, there are thousands of these sculptures. Some of them are half buried, some of them are completely buried, some of them are just poking out from the ground, and many of them are up above the ground. There are thousands of them, thousands. And they all look the same, except for some have hats and some don't. But these are their ancestors that they worshipped. Can you imagine building these things? They're, they're like 10 feet tall, 12, 15 feet tall, some of them. And they all look the same, and there's nothing else on the island except this. There's hardly even any trees. So th this is, I mean, they, they put their whole effort of their life into these things. These are Matsevot. The ones with hats are ascetic. <laughs> Doug says the ones with hats are Hasidic. Yeah, that looks like a Stremel, which is a hat that the Hasidic Jews wear. Now look at this. Look at this. These are matzavot. These are, these are mastabas in Egypt. That's where the word, that's where their word mastaba came from, is matzaba. And that's what it is. They're buildings. They're low they're like, they look like altars. They're just low buildings with a flat top. But in this case, there's things inside. Usually tombs, but not always. Usually, there's a rock inside, which is, a, which is why they're called a mastaba. There's like a memorial stone inside. So you can see the doors on it. Doors on the mastaba. This is what I want you to picture when it says in the Bible, Mastaba. And not just a rock. You can picture this if you want. You can picture these stones. But it's much, much bigger than that. Now, these are also mastaba, uh, Matzabas, Matzavot. These are totem poles. And what I'm trying to show you is that every culture on earth, I don't care where it is, every culture on earth sets up Matzavot. Which is why God says, don't do it. You're Jews, you're supposed to be different from every culture on earth. Well, these are matz matzavot. This one down here, these are all over Sweden. Now, the, the reason I have this is because I never really thought about, you know, the Swedish people, the Swedes, setting up matzavot. But these are all over Sweden, and they look like phalluses. And, they're, and they go from about two feet tall to 10 feet tall. And they are phalluses. And they're made out of white marble. And they're all over Sweden. These are matzivot. That's what they would worship. And then, this is really cool. Cool, I say cool. I say cool because of what it teaches us. But it's horrible. It's horrifying. This is Pompey's pillar. Now, Pompey was one of this, the, the Greek kings. Pompey was, a, a, it was a, a, a Caesar, actually. So Greek and then Roman. Uh, and it's in Egypt. There's a sphinx on one side and a sphinx on the other side. This thing, I believe, is about 30 feet tall. And it has a capital on the top. And it's in the middle of nowhere, holding up nothing. And that's what a mas, ma, matzeva is. It doesn't hold anything up. It's not like a pillar on the house that serves a function. The only function for this is people to worship. That's what it is. By the way, if you look up sacred stones on the internet, sacred meaning holy or you know of God, you look up sacred stones, this is what you find all over the world. They're called sacred stones for a reason, because they represent a god, or gods, plural. In this case, Pompey saying, I'm your god, you will worship me. And you have to look up to do it. But notice, that has a capital on top. And it's not just for pretty. 
capitals are, you know, I thought an architectural element that are on the top of columns, pillars, that hold up a house. Mm -mm. That means something. A Greek or Roman capital on top of a pillar means something. It communicated to them about their God. That's why it looks the way it looks. It's not just pretty. So what I want you to see is that the description that are in you know, all the Bible dictionaries and stuff like that, it'll say uh, a pillar supporting a house. No, that's a different word in Hebrew, which I'm going to show you. But not a, mas not a matzeva. It doesn't hold anything up. None of these do. Here's some more, but these are in the Bible. Remember, you can look up on the top and you can see what the subject of this page is. These are mat this is matzeva in the Bible. Now, uh, the history of Jacob is filled with matzeva. He did it several times. And remember, God says, I hate the matzeva. And yet Jacob, who he loves, remember it says in Romans 11, Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. Before they did anything good or bad, Jacob is loved by God because he loved and did Judaism. Just like his father Isaac and just like his grandfather Abraham. Genesis 32, 13. So this is after, um, after uh, Jacob had already gone to Haran, and he was with his father, his his father-in-law, Lavan, who is a, a a thief and an idolater, and he's come back to Israel now. So he, he spent 20 years in, in Haran, and now he's coming back. 32, uh, 12. I will surely prosper you and make your seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered in multitude. What he's doing is he's praying and he's saying back to God what God had promised him. Verse 13. So he spent the night there, and there is at Hamakom. Then he selected from what he had, with, uh, from what he had with him a present, for his brother Esav, where am I? Two thirteen. Oh, I'm in the wrong. I'm in the wrong uh, chapter. Um, chapter thirty one, I think. Yeah, it's chapter thirty one. Sorry about that. So he's coming back from Haran, and he goes to the same place, uh, Hamakom, verse twelve. No, verse thirteen. And God says, I am the God of Bethel. Now, he, I'm sorry, he's not in Bethel yet. He's still in Haran. And, he's, and this is where God tells him to get up and leave and go back to, to Israel. So God says, I am the God of Bethel, where, where you anointed a matzavah, where you made a vow to me. Now get up, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. So this is where God, he's in Haran, and God is telling him, get up and go, and go to Israel, and go back to the place where you set up a matzavah and anointed it. Now God doesn't say to him, I hate matzavot. He says, I want you to get up and go back there where you anointed that, that uh, matzavah. Go back there. Now in Genesis uh, 31, 51, he gets there. He gets to Bethel to Hamakom, to Jerusalem. And Lavan, uh, oh, this is the next one, I'm sorry. We, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta, we're gonna go back to when he comes back to the uh, Matzibah. But before we do that, we're gonna look at this. This is where you can see in the Bible that it is a big, huge thing, it's not a rock. And you can see it very clearly. So it says in Genesis 31 and 51, as he's leaving, Laban catches up to him and says, what are you doing? You're leaving with all my stuff. And, and they make a covenant between them that Laban is not going to go to Israel to pursue him, and uh, Jacob is not going to pursue Har um, Laban by going back to Haran and attacking him. So they make a big covenant, 
And they build this, this mastaba, matzaba. 31.51, Laban said to Jacob, Behold, this heap, now it just says heap in Hebrew, uh, uh, um, gal, it's just a heap. And behold, the pillar which I have set between you and me. So there's a heap and a matzava. A, a heap and a pillar, or matzava. Now, when we think of heap, we just think of a big pile of stones. No. In the Bible, it's so much more organized than that. Picture this. This is a heap. If they're arranged, they're built, they're constructed. This took time. And then, I'm going to show you this. And then it says... Um, this heap, or this, this, this pile of stones, this building of stones, is an ed, a witness, and this pillar, this matzavah, is a witness, that I will not pass by this gal to you for harm, and you will not pass by this gal and this matzavah to me for harm. Look at, um, oh, where is it? Let's go back to uh, verse 45. So he says, Jacob took a stone and set it up as a matzavah. And Jacob's, so if you just picture a matzavah as just a rock, it's just a rock, right? But look what it says. And Jacob said to his brothers, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, gonna, <laughs> he took a stone and set it up as a matzavah. And Jacob said to his brothers, Gather stones. So they took stones and made a gal, a, what we translate as heap. And they ate there. It does not say by the heap in Hebrew. It says on top of the heap. They ate there on top of this pile of stones, this heap of stones. You, you can't just pile up a bunch of stones and then everybody have a big meal on top of it. There has to be a platform. This is what it was. And they all got up on top of it, and they made vows to each other, and they had the sacrifice up on the heap. That means there's an altar. And then they ate together as a covenant meal, saying, we're making a covenant between your people and my people. It's not just one or two guys. It's a whole bunch of guys. We're making a, a, a covenant between your guys and my guys. And they ate a covenant meal there on top of the matzavah. So, Lavan called the, this matzava Yagar Sahaduta, that's Aramaic, and Yaakov called it Galid, Gal, heap, Ed. It's not Galid, it's Gal Ed. Gal Ed, Ed means witness, a, a, a pile of witness, a, a building, a structure of witness, this stone that's on this structure, has seen and heard, and it's a witness. So this is a much bigger thing than you think it is when you read a pile of stones, or you read set up a rock as a pillar. It's so much bigger than that. Now we're going to go to when he, he carries, and he continues on his journey, and he gets to, um, he gets to back to Jerusalem, back to Hamakom, and in Genesis 35, verse 14, um, he says, well, verse 13, Then God went up from him in Hamakom, where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a matzavah in Hamakom, where he had spoken with him. I thought he already did that. So is this just reviewing the past? Or did he do it again? Spoken with him a pillar, a matzavah of stone. And he poured out a libation on it. I thought he already did that. He also poured oil on it. I thought he already did that. So is this a second time? Or is it just reviewing what he did in the past? In the same place, the same thing. I don't know. I don't care. Because it's, a, it's the same picture. And that's what's being communicated to us that God lays the pictures one on top of the other over and over again so that we get the idea. And he communicates something to us. And that's what's happening here. I think, personally, that he did it again. And I think he made it bigger. 
And I think he made something more like this. Remember, in the same spot, when Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Yitzchak, it was in the same exact spot on Mount Moriah, Mount Moriah, at Hamakom. And it says that Abraham built an altar. It's not, don't picture a little thing with, you know, those curvy horns on the top like they show us. It's not like that. An altar is huge. It's huge. Maybe 10 feet by 10 feet, 4 feet tall. And it's, it's a, you know, 100-year-old man doing this. Actually, older than that. At that point, he was 100 and, uh, 137. And he built an altar. It's kind of like a matzabah. Well, now Jacob is doing the same thing at the same spot. So we see this picture happening over and over again. Now this is the third time, one, two, three, sorry, the fourth time that Jacob has set up a matzavah. Now he's going to do it again. Let's go to Genesis 35, verse 20. So he leaves Jerusalem, and he's going, and uh, Rachel is pregnant with Benjamin, and she gives birth to Benjamin right outside Jerusalem, about five miles outside of Jerusalem at Bethlehem, and then she dies. And in verse 20, verse 20, uh, 19, Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrat, Bethlehem, and Jacob set up a pillar, sorry, set up a matzavah over her grave. That is the matzavah of Rachel's grave to this day. Jews don't do this anymore. Muslims do. Muslims do this. They still do it to this day. In every single Muslim city, every one of them in the Middle East, there is a matzavah. And guess what they call it? They call it the makom. That's what they call it, makom. Here's one of them. This is Rachel's tomb. This is what it looks like. And all of the tombs of all the holy people in Islam have a tomb that looks exactly like this. It's a cube with a, with a dome on top. They all look the same. And it's called a makam, which is makam. And they even say it means the place. And they go there and they pray in every Muslim city in the Middle East. Well, Rachel's tomb, I don't know if this was built the same kind of structure. I don't know if if Jacob built the same kind of structure or not. And I don't really care. All I know is he built a stone matzavah there. And it was turned into a stone matzavah like this called uh, a makom, a, a makam, or makom, the place. So you can see that this has continued. It's a big thing. It's not just a stone. It's a house. I, I personally believe that he did build something like this with an interior, like a mastaba. So he set up a matzava at Rachel's tomb. Not over Rachel's tomb, at Rachel's tomb. Now, 2 Samuel 18, 18. This is about Avshalom, who is a picture of the false messiah. Uh, he's David's son. He's the most handsome guy in the whole kingdom tallest guy in the kingdom, and he is beautiful, and he's got long hair that goes all the way down to his butt. 2 Samuel 18 to 18. Now Absalom, in his life, had taken and set up for himself a matzavah, which is in the king's valley. That's the valley of Kidron. That's where all the kings are buried, in the valley of Kidron. For he said, I have no son to preserve my name. So he named the matzavah after his own name. In other words, that matzavah is me. Worship it. This is the closest thing I could think of. Pompey says, that matzavah is me. Worship it. Well, Absalom did the same thing. Only it's not a pillar. And we know that because it's there to this day. And I saw it. And I threw rocks at it. 
So he named the pillar after his own name, and it is called Avshalom's Matzebah to this day. This is what it looks like. It's still there. It looks very Greek. That's a Greek top. So I don't know if that was added or changed. I don't know. But this is the Matzebah. Now right here next to it is a tomb inside the rock. It's a huge cave. I went in there too. And uh, it's still open. Anybody can go in there. And it's the cave in which the bones and the ossuary of Avshalom were placed. But this is the Matzebah. Right next to the right next to the cave. And it's huge. It's probably 40 feet tall. And you're supposed to throw rocks at it because Avshalom's a bad guy. And in Judaism, we put a rock on a tomb of a, or, or of a gravestone of somebody who's righteous or a family member. But in this case, you don't put a rock on it. You throw rocks at it because he's evil. And it's there to this day. And this is in the Kidron Valley, which is right, you know, out, right out, right to the west. Sorry, to the east of the temple. It's that big valley right as you go up the hill to Jerusalem. It's the big valley right in front of the temple. And that's where all the kings are buried. Well, he's got his own matzibah, and that's what God hates. That's what God said not to do. This is what God said to do. This is what God said to do. This is what God said not to do. Do not set up a matzavah for people to worship it or worship you. And that's what he did. Jacob set up his matzavah to worship God. So, the word matzavah means something stationed in the Bible. We're going to keep looking at matzavah in the Bible. And it's um, a column, a pillar, a column, but not holding up anything. Just a pillar or a column. That doesn't go anywhere. That you have to look up and say, oh, this guy is amazing, I'm going to worship him. 2 Kings 3, 2. Now, now notice that it can also mean a garrison. A garrison is a fort, like, you know, Fort Sumter. A garrison, a, a, you know, a big, uh, this, a big building that you can hide in. 2 Kings 3. So this is, I want you to think bigger when you think about Matzavah. So now, you have northern Israel and southern Judah, and they've divided, and there's nothing but idolatry in northern Israel. There's some, a lot of idolatry in Judah, but there's some worship of God also, along with it. So 2 Kings chapter 3, this is talking about Yehoram, one of the early kings of the north, the son of Ahab and Jezebel. And it says, well, I'll read from verse 1. Yehoram, uh, son of Ahab, became king over Israel at Samaria. Verse 2, he did evil in the sight of the Lord, although not like his dad and his mom, because he put away the matzavah of Baal. Now it gets really strange. This story gets really strange. He put away, he got rid of the matzavah of Baal. So what was it? Was it a pillar? Was it a stone? Was it a house? What was it? <clears throat> Which his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sins of Jeroboam ben Nebat, which he made Israel sin with. Now if you, you read on, this, this matzavah, it says he got rid of it, he put it away, but it comes back. So we're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 10, and a few generations later, Yehu, which was a good guy, he was, he was raised up to be the king in, in Israel, but he was a good guy. He was smart. He got rid of Ahab and Jezebel. Um, 2 Kings 10, 26. It's very strange. Well, verse 25. <clears throat> as soon as he had finished offering the Ola, the burnt offering that Yehu said, Yehu said to the guard and the royal officers, go in and kill them. Let none come out. So what he did was he got all the worshippers of Baal and stuck them in the house of Baal and then said, go in the house and kill them all, now that we got them all in the same place. And so they killed them. They killed them with the edge of the sword 
and the guard and the royal officers threw them out and went to the inner room of the house of Baal. It's set up just like the temple. You have an outer room, the holy place, and then you have an inner room, the holy of holies. And in that inner room, the holy of holies, for them, for Baal, there's something. There's an idol. And they brought out what it says is the sacred pillars of the house of Baal. It doesn't say that. It says the matzavah, the matzavot. They take the matzavah of Baal out of the house of Baal and burned them. Then it says they also broke down the matzavah of Baal. I thought they'd already taken it out and burned it. But now it says, after it's burned, they broke down the matzavah of Baal. And then it says, they brought out the matzavot of the house of Baal and burned. They also broke down the matzavah of Baal and broke down the house of Baal and made it a latrine, a bathroom to this day. So, this matzibah was destroyed or killed twice. The, remember, the matzibah is a picture of that demon that you're supposed to worship. In the case of Avshalom, who's a picture of the false messiah, who died twice, he had his own matzibah that was a picture of him. Named it after his own name and said, worship me there. And he died twice. Now, in this case, the matzibah is destroyed twice. They bring it out of the house, and they burn it, and then they destroy it. So you tell me what that means. It, uh, it's, he dies twice. The, 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 the matzibah dies twice. So in that day, sorry, Yehu removed the matzibah of Baal, burned it, and then destroyed it. Now, Isaiah chapter 19 talks about in the day of the Lord. That in that day, so is this going to be a good matzavah or a bad matzavah? I'm dying to find out. Isaiah 19, this is about Egypt in the day of the Lord, in the kingdom. 1919. In that day, there will be a matzavah, does not say an altar. No, I'm sorry, it does say altar here. In that day there will be a Mizbeach, an altar to the Lord, in the middle of the land of Egypt, and a Matzavah to the Lord at its border. Now remember, the Sinai Peninsula is not, doesn't belong to Israel. It belongs to Egypt. That is Egypt. And so at the Sinai Peninsula, down by the Gaza Strip, where Israel meets Sinai, there's going to be a big Matzavah just like Jacob made with his father-in-law, Laban, like this. A giant matzavah where everybody will say, let's go worship there. A matzavah was supposed to be the place of worship. And so for Egypt, remember in, in, in the last chapter of Zechariah, it says that Egypt has to come up for Sukkot to Jerusalem to do Judaism. And if they don't, there will be no rain on them. Well, there's going to be an altar and there will be a matzavah at the border so that they can go worship there whenever they want. And they have to do Sukkot and they have to do the other festivals, the other you know three festivals at those proper times. But they can go worship God anytime they want at the matzavah in the kingdom. This is in the kingdom. So this is a good matzavah. This is good just like the matzavah that was in Hamakom in Jerusalem. Now, in uh, Hoshea chapter 3, this is talking about the time that we're in right now. The last 2,000 years, in which there's no temple. There's no, there's no temple to have all of Judaism come out of that temple. And for everybody to go up and see Judaism in practice. There's no temple. There's no king over Judah. There's no sacrifices being made. But neither is there idolatry. There's no teraphim, which is a, a household idol. So Hoshea chapter 3, um, verse 4, it says, The sons of Israel will remain for many days. That's the time period we're in now. 
Do not look for the Bible to tell you about prophecy now. There isn't any. There's only prophecy about the day of the Lord. This is the time period we're in right now. The sons of Israel will remain for many days without king, without prince, without sacrifices, zavachim, without matzavot, without matzavah, without ephod, that's the priest would wear an ephod to make decisions, and without teraphim, household idols. So it's a time of in-between. Not in Israel, don't have the temple, but neither are we idol worshippers. We're in between until the day of the Lord. That's the time period we're in now. But it says they'll be for many days without a matzavah, without a place to worship God, whether it be Jerusalem or somewhere else, but a matzavah. Okay, now there are other words for pillar, and the, the, the most important thing that you that you understand about a matzavah is that it doesn't, it's not a pillar holding up a house. It doesn't hold anything up. It's just, it's there to worship. It's there as a representation of a demon. It doesn't hold up a house. There's other words for that. Now, there's the word nitziv. Um, this is what Lot's wife was turned into. When it says a pillar of salt, it's not a matzavah. It's a natsiv, and it means something set or something placed, a prefect, a leader, or an officer, something placed. It's kind of the same word, you know, set up, placed, but it's different, natsiv. And that's what uh, Lot's wife became. So whatever that is, that's what she became, made out of salt. And here's the other big word, amud. And it comes from amad, which means to stand, and that's all it means. This could be a column for a house, a pillar for a house, an amut. And it means something standing, to stand, to endure, to stand up, to a point. Now Exodus 13, 21 says that God walked around, and, and there's a whole lot of verses that say this, that God walked around in the form of a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. Well, pillar is this word amud, from standing. Well, what do you stand on? You stand on feet. You stand on legs, and those legs he walked on. So that's why it says he walked as a pillar of fire, because they're standing, they're, they're walking. Um, in 1 Kings 7, 15, and then many other passages, it describes this. It describes Solomon's temple with two pillars or two legs in front of it, on either side of the door. And these are amud, they are amud, they're a, a, a pillar. Um, and they have pomegranates on top. I've talked about this before. Pomegranate contains seed. And this is God's legs. And in between his legs is the seed. Or at the top of his legs is the seed or testicles. And it's through there that you enter his house. You come through the seed of God to enter his house. That's the Messiah. That's how you get into God's presence is the Messiah, the seed of, of God. So these are pillars. These are amud. They stand. Now in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, it references this. And, it, and remember, this is not a matzavah. It's a totally different word. Revelation 3 says uh, Yeshua is talking to the believers in the kingdom, in the birth pangs, not just the ones that were in existence in the first century, and not us. He's talking in the day of the Lord to the believers in the day of the Lord. And one of the things he says is in verse 12, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write upon him the name of my God, etc. I will write upon him the name of my God. Jerusalem has his name impressed on it. And so we'll be like little Jerusalems, and we'll be like little temples, and we'll have the pillars. We will be a pillar in the house of God. There are lots of pillars in the house of God, many, 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 and they hold up the house. But these two, they don't hold up anything except the seed. But there's many pillars in the temple. There were hundreds of them. And 
temple. They were all broken down by by uh, Titus, by Babylon, and then by Titus, the Roman emperor. But there were temples in the kingdom, and that's what it's referring to, Amud, not Matzavah. So don't get these two concepts mixed up of a pillar that holds up stuff and a pillar that doesn't hold up stuff. It's there as a, as a building, as a memorial, as a, as a signpost, as a trophy, as a place to worship. Now, we're going to go from this, the Matseva, and we're going to move into Sava. Sava. Jacob arose early, took the stone, and set it up as a Matseva, and poured oil, that means he anointed it, on its top. Then he named that place Bethel. Jacob said, this stone, which I have set up as a Matseva, will be God's house. It will be. A thousand years in the future. This matzava will be God's house. Now you can see inside the word matzava is a tzadi and a vet. It's the two middle letters, tzadi and vet. But the vet can also be vav. They sound the same. Vav is this letter. I can't reach that one over there. Here it is. It's that letter, tzav. So, matseva and sava are related words. They basically mean the same thing. Now, tsav or tsava, which is where the word mitzvah, which is translated commandment, that's what it is. Mitzava. Mitzava. Matseva. They're almost the same thing. So, it could be good or it could be bad. You've seen that a matzavah is either good or bad. Well, so is mitzvah. Mitzvah is either good or bad. Mitzvah does not mean a good deed. That's the way people say, I'm going to do a mitzvah. What is that? I'm going to do a good deed. No, it's not. It means whatever tzava means. Whatever this word means, tzava. Now, Strong's Concordance says it means to command, to charge, to give orders, to lay or give charge to. Uh, charge to to order or lay charge upon these are you know these are heavy to give charge to to give command to to give charge unto to appoint to command to ordain people read that and they're like yeah that makes sense God has commandments mitzvot their commandments and Jacinius says the same thing Jacinius here's his translation of the word sava the root of mitzvah to set up. Now, up to that point, he's fine. Justinius is absolutely correct. Sava means to set up. He's absolutely right. And then he gives the Hebrew, I'm sorry, the Syrian and the Arabic for it, which say the same thing. But then he goes on and he says, to constitute to a point. That's not bad. It's not too bad. Anyone over anything, followed by, as I don't know what that means, of person and all of the thing, on something. Then it gives examples. Then it says, to cause to exist. All the host of it, the heaven have I, sava, appointed, set up. Cause to exist. All right, that's not too bad. But then he takes a left turn. And if you look up mitzvah, which is from the root sava. This is how he translates it. A command. Very first thing that he writes. A command. A precept. God has commandments. Especially used of the precepts of God. Then he gives all these verses. The idea of prohibition. Prohibition. You, thou shalt not. That's a mitzvah. Any of, you shall not. The prohibition is found, Leviticus 4, etc. Any of the mitzvot of Jehovah, which ought not to be done, that is, things prohibited by his precepts. So now, it has become a merry-go-round of saying the same thing. And you keep coming back to the same point. You've left the root. If you leave the root, then it means to set up or establish, you're done. You're wrong. And so... This has entered, this. now remember, this was a Christian who did this, Jusinius. 
and a Christian Strong's who did what he did in writing the Concordance. They were in a Christian culture. It's in the 1800s, after 1800 years of Christian Edomic, Edom, Rome thought, Hellenist, Hellenistic thought in the church. This didn't come out of Judaism. But in Judaism, it's just the opposite. This is from, uh, you can find this on the internet, it's called Yesh Shem, Yesh Shem. And that's the name of the organization and the site. And they study Kabbalah. I'm not gonna make any comments on Kabbalah. It's pictures, but if you don't know it as pictures, it's craziness. But if you read it as pictures, it ain't that hard. But if you don't, it's impossible you're going to end up doing commandments. But in the writings of Kabbalah, it says this, the word Sav translates as command. As taught by the Zohar, command is idol worship. A Jew reading that is like, what are you talking about? A mitzvah is idol worship? This seems very shocking, considering one hears often from religious people, I do this mitzvah because Hashem commands me to do it. It is important to realize that concealed in the word mitzvah is the word tzav, tzadi vav. And remember, mitzvah sounds exactly like matzevah. And there's good matzevah and there's bad matzevah. In the same way, there's good mitzvah and bad mitzvah. And that's basically what it's saying. He's going to say some more about this. But I want to look first at where it comes from. Now, the word natsav Mitzvah comes from natsav, means to set, to put, to place, to be set over, to stand, to stand up, to put in place. Where is the sense of command in that? It's just putting something in place, setting it up, making it stable. That's all it means. To stand up, to put in place, to erect, to be planted, fixed, or settled. There is no sense of command in this. This is an idol being set up. It has the face, face of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not Yeshua. The, you know, what we call Jesus Christ is not Yeshua. They took the word the out of Jesus the Christ, making it sound like it's his last name. Jesus the Christ, that's okay, it's Greek, that's a fine statement. But it's not a name. It came from this image of Jesus Christ came from the Greek gods, kings. The kings that set up a matzavah and said, you will worship me, and this is me. But they never looked like this. They were old, fat, balding, ugly. But this is the face they put on their coins and then on their matzavot saying, this is me. And that's where the images of, quote, Jesus Christ came from. That's the whole story from Hanukkah that I might deal with at Hanukkah. Now, the word matzavah, you can see matzavah comes from this word natsav, which is just like the word tzava and mitzvah. The only difference is one letter. The, the, va, the vet became a vav. That's all, and they sound the same. So matzavah, station set up, a monument or a pillar, a set up thing, a statue or an idol. Matzavah is mitzvah. They're the same thing. And they're good or they're bad. Now in Matthew 24, 15, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which, in case you don't know, is an idol. It's a thing. It's, a, it's an idol. The abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. This is this word. To stand. To erect. To make to stand. Natsav, to set, to put in place, to be set over, to stand, to stand up. So that's why he used this word. It's natsaving on the matseva. This is a bad matseva, the abomination of desolation. So you, hopefully you can see the two coming together, matseva and mitzvah. You can see them coming together, that they're basically the same thing. And one is bad and one is good. One matzavah is bad and one matzavah is good. One mitzvah is bad and one, mitzvah, 
mitzvah is good. Now here's the rest of the words from Yeshem. This blows my mind. The word sav translates as command. As taught by the Zohar, command is idol worship. The Kabbalah, the Kabbalah also explains that when someone accepts a command from someone, or even from God, from Hashem, they are giving up their free will and becoming a slave to whoever makes that command. So if you say that you want to obey God's commands, what you're doing is you're setting aside your free will and saying, God, I want to be your servant. I'm going to obey your command. You then become a slave. But it's not a good thing. You're not a bond servant of Christ. It's a bad thing to give up your free will. Judaism doesn't function that way. Judaism always, always offers a choice. You wear tzitzit or kippah. You can choose to wear it or not. But if you wear it, let it talk to you. Let the kippah talk to you. You use your free will to do the thing, and then you use your free will to listen to it. Judaism as law, or Christianity as law, doesn't function that way. It says, I will obey thee, O Lord, and be a good ser I'll be a good bondservant of thine. Give me a, you know, a brownie point and a pat on the butt and a gold star. And make me feel good about you liking me. But that's not what Judaism is. Judaism does not function like that at all. It's, I want to know you. So I'm going to do this stuff and it will talk to me and I'll get to know you. Period. That's all Judaism is. You make a model, or you do the model, you look at it, it talks to you, it preaches to you, and you get to know God. Period. There is no command. There is no obedience. It does not exist in the Bible. It doesn't exist in the Hebrew. It doesn't exist as a concept. It doesn't exist even as a word in the Bible. It may exist to you, but it doesn't exist in the Bible. So if you're going to talk about obedience and commandment, you must leave the biblical world to do that. But if you're in the Bible world, there's no such thing. There's mitzvah, which means something set up or established. That's it. And you can do it or not do it. It's up to you. So let's go back to these, this concept. I've written these two statements here to try to make it clear. Jacob set up and anointed the matzavah in Jerusalem. That's good. That's fantastic. That's why God never said, don't do that. Judaism is done to listen to, to come to know God, and to come to know the Messiah. That is a mitzvah. This is a matzavah. This is a mitzvah. And that's good. But there's also a bad matzavah and a bad mitzvah. Idolaters set up another matzavah in Jerusalem. That's bad. Remember, they put those matzavot there in God's house. And I say, you can agree with this or not, because these are my words, any religion that says obey God or follow commands is the same thing. It is a bad mitzvah, a bad matzavah. And that's why it's all over the world. These are all over the world. In every culture on the planet, there are bad matzavot. Every culture. Pompey said, you will worship me. It's a command. These ancestors say, you will worship me. It's a command. That Ashok pillar and the Buddhists, that lion god, whatever that is, says, you will worship me. And people do commands. Now, I mean... This, <laughs> I'll use my mouse because so like, I can't reach it. The phallic stones in Sweden. You will worship fertility God. You will worship me. And you will do it in this manner with a religion, with a certain religion. That's where religion comes from. All religions, 
Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, animism, paganism, all of it. All, all religion comes from the same place. I want to be happy with you, oh, whoever you are, Lord. I want to be happy. I want you to be happy with me. I want, I want you to like me. I don't want you to hurt me. And so I'll worship you with this religion. Christianity and Judaism is the same thing. Except for God gave Judaism and then said, do these things, let it talk to you, and you can come to know me. It's the only difference. And when you say Christianity, there's no such thing. There's just Yeshua came in Judaism as a Jew, did Judaism, taught Judaism, showed us what things in Judaism meant, related them to the, to the Torah, and then said, here's what you're missing about it, basically. That's all it is. That's all Yeshua did. And then Paul, Shaul, Saul, paid attention to all that and made it sort of understandable to the people who were believers so that they could invite Gentiles in. That's all Shaul did. But that is impossible to understand if you come at it believing there's such a thing as Christianity. There isn't. There's Judaism. And Gentiles are invited into that. But not a Judaism of commands. A Judaism of pictures. Of models. Of shadows. Of types. Of patterns. One laid on top of the other over and over again until you get the point. That's all Judaism is. And you can do it or not do it. Now in Revelation 2.9, it says this. I know your tribute, now remember, he's talking to believers in the day of the Lord, in the birth pangs. Because it says in chapter 1, verse 10, that John was taken to the day of the Lord, and he recorded what he heard. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you're rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews, but they're not. Now think about that statement. Yeshua says, I know the people are saying they're Jews, but they're not Jews. I take that to be Christians. Now you may not. I take that to be people who are in this form of religion and they're doing Jewish stuff, but they're not Jews because they're doing the wrong mitzvah. They're doing the wrong matzavot. They're trying to obey commands. They think that there are laws, but there aren't. And they persecute the ones who are really Jews who just want to know God. By the way, it says it in Galatians chapter 4, that as it was then with Isaac and, and Ishmael, so it is now, that those who are not understanding the pictures in Judaism persecute those who do. It says that in Galatians chapter 4. Revelation 3, 9. Oh, I'm sorry, it says, who say they are Jews and are not, but are of a, this is a weird statement, synagogue of Satan. Now, anti-Semitic Gentiles read this for the last 2,000 years and persecuted Jews and said, you're of your father the devil. You're in the synagogue of Satan. But it's quite the opposite. The Jews are persecuted by those who don't know God. And those are the ones who are in the synagogue of Satan. So it could be Gentiles, it could be Jews, it doesn't matter. But if they're, if they're not doing Judaism to know God, they're not really Jews. Now think about that word, Judaism, Yehudot, Jews. Yehudot is Judaism, Yehudim is Jews. Yehudot is Judaism, Yehudim is Jews. It's the same word the way of the Jew. Revelation 3, 9, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they're Jews, but they're not. They lie. I, I like reading it like that instead of, I shall make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews, yet are not, but lieth. I mean, there's just no meat in that. There's no guts. I want you to picture Yeshua saying this. 
I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they're Jews, but they're not. They're liars. Picture that. I will make them come and bow down before your feet and know that I have loved you. So there are two Judaisms, two mitzvot, which is exactly the same word as matzivot. They're the same word, which is why in Kabbalah it says that, that mitzvot, or obeying a command, is idolatry. When I taught this back in summer, just the word sav and mitzvot, when I taught this, I, the very first thing I said was, this is, the favorite, this is my favorite teaching I've ever given. It's the most important teaching I've ever given. It is. If, if you can't understand that Judaism is not commands to be followed, you cannot ever know what, why God gave Judaism. You will end up doing Hellenism. There is no way around it. There's no way around it. You'll end up doing Hellenism. You'll end up being, quote, Christianized, so that you can understand what I'm saying by Hellenism. Because you'll either go that way or you'll go into, you know, you'll try to be a super Jew. And there's no way around it. You're going to do one or the other. But if you can understand that when God gave Judaism, he gave it as a set of pictures, you can probably set up a proper matzibah. But if you don't, you can't. It's impossible you're going to end up setting up the wrong months and you're going to go the same way that everybody else has. And remember where that matzavah was set up? In Jerusalem, at Hamakom. Now, in Judaism, there are two Jerusalems. There's the Jerusalem above, Yerushalayim Me'ola, uh, Jerusalem ascended. And there's a Jerusalem below, directly, directly correlating to it. One on top of the other. The Jerusalem below is Yerushalayim Shel Mata, Jerusalem down below. And they correspond to one another. You have the bottom one so you can look at it, do it, smell it, taste it, feel it, touch it, and so you can understand this one up here. Because you can't understand it otherwise. You can't. Judaism was given to understand the incomprehensible, what we cannot understand otherwise. So, down below, there was, there's a good matzavah, a good altar, a good pillar, a good uh, mastaba, reflecting the house of God above, and it will be restored in the kingdom. It will be. The real matzavah will be restored in the kingdom. What, what Jacob saw, and what Jacob set up, and what Jacob did, when he saw the temple in heaven, and he saw... The, 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 mesula, the sula going up to heaven and the angels going up and down. He saw heaven. He saw the whole thing and God standing above the, the, the staircase. He saw God standing above it. Well, how's that possible? Because he saw heaven. And he was directly below it. And so that is going to be restored. That temple is going to be restored in the kingdom. But you know what? The bad matzavah will be re reinstituted in the kingdom also in the birth pangs. The bad matzavah will be reinstituted in the birth pangs by the false messiah in the birth pangs of the day of the Lord. And this is what it's going to look like. It's called the abomination of desolation. That is, it. That is the ultimate bad matzavah. And the ultimate good matzavah is, sorry, went the wrong way, is this, the temple. And they're both in the same place. So they're both going to be reinstituted. So if the good matzivah is going to be reinstituted, what does that mean for us? It doesn't just mean there's going to be a temple. It means that the form of worship that God gave, which is Judaism, will be reinstituted. Which is why I wrote the book, When All the Pictures Are Restored. It is going to be restored. So we can set up a good matzivah in our heart Here's where the rubber hits the road, Jack. You can set up a good matzavah in your heart. 
And we can see that in Exodus 25, one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament. Exodus 25, 8, I don't even have to turn to it. It says, Va'asu li mikdash v'shachanti betocham. When God gives Moshe the pattern, tavnit, or picture of the tabernacle, in the mountain, like a hologram, like a holograph, you can see all the way around it, you can see on top, underneath, inside, uh, and yet it was in the mountain. When he saw that, God said to him, you set it up exactly as I have shown you in the mountain. And then he says, Va'asu li mikdash v'shach anti betocham. Let them build or construct for me a tabernacle, a mikdash. Why? V'shach anti, so that in so that I can dwell. V'shach means to sit or dwell. So I can sit or dwell anti me, but tocham inside them. Not inside the house, inside them. Do Judaism so I can live inside you. Do Judaism so that you can feel me inside you. It's basically what it is. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Don't you know that you're the temple, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? the Holy Spirit dwells inside of it. What gives him the right to say that? Because it's in Exodus 25. And by the way, it's repeated almost word for word in the time of Solomon when he's building the temple. He says, build this temple so that you can dwell among your people, inside your people. Same words. And that's what uh, uh, Shaul is quoting in 1 Corinthians 3.16. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. If, if you do Judaism, if you do Judaism, 1 Peter 2.5 says the same thing. You are living stones being built up into a temple. If you're doing Judaism. Now it doesn't mean if you're not doing Judaism, you're not, the Holy Spirit's not inside of you. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that. Because of the enculturation of 2,000 years, all of that original stuff has been lost. But the truth is still there that Yeshua is the Messiah and he'll give you the Holy Spirit. You'll just be ignorant of God. You'll have him inside, but you'll be ignorant. But it's, it's always been like that. And just because you have the Holy Spirit inside doesn't make you smart. And it doesn't make you pretty. It doesn't make you good looking. It doesn't make your life better. It just means that God is dwelling inside of you. But if you do the right pictures, you'll learn about the God that's inside of you, and you'll become smarter and prettier and all that stuff. I'm just mocking, but you know, you know what I'm saying. It gets better. So just like we can set up a, a good mitzvah, a good matzavah in our heart, like Jacob did, we can set up a bad matzavah in our heart, which is why I wrote the book that I wrote, Obedience or understanding. Obedience or understanding. You can go one way or you can go the other. On the top of the book cover, I have chains and shackles. Why? Because that's what religion is. It puts you in bondage. It makes you a slave. Even if it's to Hashem, as it says in Kabbalah. Even if that slavery is to Hashem, it's not good. The matzibah was set up in Hamakom in Jerusalem below, which is Zion. It's not Christianity. It's Judaism. It's Zion. So you can set up a bad matzavah in your heart by doing, trying to do Judaism. But by the same token, you can set up a good matzavah in your heart by doing Judaism as a little child who does it and looks at the patterns that are one on top of the other and goes, ah, oh, I can see it. That's cool. And get to know God. So that's why I have this on the cover. This, you know, the shadow being cast by Yeshua, as it says in Colossians chapter 2, 16 and 17, that the shadow cast by Yeshua is the kosher laws, the new moon, the Sabbath, and the festivals. That's Judaism. Those are the four basics of Judaism. So what is the shadow cast by Yeshua? Judaism.
Do it as a shadow. Do it, and then look at it, let it talk to you, and listen to it. So you can go one way or the other, but you can't do both. You cannot set up a matzavah and then worship God on it properly and then worship a, a devil, a demon, Hasatan, be in the synagogue of Satan at the same time. You can't erect some giant pillar to yourself and name it after you and say, worship me because I'm so great. And at the same time, be a simple child doing Judaism and setting up a good matzavah where God is worshipped properly. You can't. So, you know, just like every teaching I give, I always leave you with a choice. I try to close the deal. You know, what, what do I have to do to get you to sign on this paper? And, you know, it's just how I am. I mean, to me, everything is very simple. You either go one way or you go the other way. And I hope I've made it clear that as far as the subject of the matzabah, what they translate as pillar, it's so much bigger than that. And it's about the proper place to worship God, and the proper way to worship God. He saw the temple. He saw Judaism being done in the temple, because he saw the one in heaven. And he saw that in the future, it was going to be right there on earth. So that's what I have to say about hope you understood it and I hope that you incorporate more Judaism into your life so that you can know God closer and closer. Shabbat Shalom.